Hello, everyone. On behalf of Geo Institute, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this webinar on the future and potential of sports management. Breathtaking, iconic, transcending, memorable, unbelievable. These are just, these are just some emotions and words which are arguably more commonplace in sport than anywhere else. Most of us who've joined this webinar today are interested in sport and can easily recall these moments in sporting folklore, which has been etched for posterity. Sport brings us together like few other things can. While every sport has its defining moments, uh, the entire global sports industry has grown in leaps and bounds since the turn of the century. From mammoth transfer fees for players to domestic cricket leagues raking in millions to national governments investing in football clubs in other countries, the world and business of sport is in the midst of massive transformation. With the advent of technology and digital platforms, this will continue over the next decade. From distribution models to sponsorship avenues to even ticketing or advertising, the industry is in the midst of being transformed. The implication of augmented and virtual reality applications, NFTs, as well as live streaming platforms, will in many ways determine the future of sports business as well as sports education. With a number of case studies from different leagues and organizations, this webinar will attempt to identify global trends in the sports industry, as well as the future of global competitions. We are indeed delighted to have received participation from more than 1300 persons from across India, as well as 17 countries from around the world. Once again, a very, very warm welcome to you all. Before we begin, I'd like to invite Prerna Gupta, member of the senior leadership team, to give you all a brief overview of Geo Institute. Over to you, Prerna. Thank you, Sunshine. Thank you very much. Uh, I also thank everyone who's joining us from around the world here and uh, my esteemed colleagues and panelists here. Uh, I would also like to thank Dr. Bill Sutton to take this uh, uh, masterclass for us at Geo Institute. So let me first, or let me begin with sharing the vision of our chairman and chairperson on whose, uh, on whose uh, vision the Geo Institute is, uh, is, is being launched. It's a philanthropic uh, vehicle founded on the personal pledge of Mr. and Mrs. Ambani, who have decided to contribute uh, significantly to the empowerment of youth in India. And this is one such initiative uh, for nation building and national development. Next, please. So at Geo Institute, uh, our vision is to create or build a research university in an innovation ecosystem. We aim to strengthen the research and innovation in the country and make it solution oriented. We also want to focus on um, addressing the problems and challenges that we face in India and addressing them at, um, at, a, a, at a fast speed. Uh, through the institution, we want to take up global challenges also in due course. Um, that make world a better place to be. And we want to do that by preparing the next generation of leaders and advancing the Indian society uh, through innovative methods. Next, please. Um, so how do we want to really do it? We want to uh, build Geo Institute as a fourth modifier for, to leapfrog India's growth in education, higher education to be specific, bringing together world scholars and thought leaders and uh, building programs, academic programs, uh, which are research first, digital first, and also multidisciplinary in nature. Uh, we want to inculcate global citizenship in our students, give them an international exposure and experience, and thereby building the skills and attributes of research, risk-taking, and entrepreneurship, um, build large-scale projects, dream big, and execute, uh, uh, execute large-scale projects. Next, please. Um, our governing council consists of uh, luminaries from different, uh, different streams, different areas, from industry, uh, from think tanks, from social sector, uh, and from industry. We have uh, people with extensive background and, uh, in, in institutional development and enterprise development. And uh, our governing council provides strategic direction uh, to Geo Institute, um, as, uh, to develop Geo Institute as a world-class university. Next, please. In addition to the governing council, we've also constituted a global advisory council where we have uh, world-renowned uh, 
thought leaders and institution builders. Um, the majority of them are uh, uh, global university presidents, and they have guided the institute, institute so far on building a very strong foundation of academic excellence, research significance, industry relevance, and social significance. Next, please. In addition to the Global Advisory Council, uh, we have engaged academic advisors, as you can see here, who are eminent globe, uh, scholars from global institutions that are helping us develop various programs at the U Institute. Um, we, we are starting with postgraduate programs, and here Dr. Bill Sutton is here today with us, who's, um, who's our program mentor for the sports management program. More on that later. Next, please. So in terms of the strategic vision in 15 years, uh, we at Geo Institute, we want to build uh, the programs in seven disciplines in the area of computing and engineering, architecture and urban planning, media, communication and journalism, arts, humanities and sciences, management and entrepreneurship, law governance policy and medicine. In about 15 years, we also hope to have about 10,000 students in a residential campus uh, with sprawling green spaces that, uh, that We'll have collaborative spaces and uh, in an innovation ecosystem where we'll have academia, industry, and entrepreneurship and incubator all in one place uh, with leading research centers uh, working on sponsored problems, research questions uh, that will address challenges in India. Next, please. To begin with our launch, our launch plan. In the first few years, we want to focus on building the postgraduate and the postdoctoral and PhD programs um, that build the foundation of the academic core at GEO Institute and also the research centers. These programs will then act as seeds to develop further programs in the area of uh, in these areas in these schools, and then uh, we'll build out their undergraduate program over time. Uh, once we've set up majority of these schools in the first 10 years, that's when we uh, graduate towards the majority phase of uh, launching specialized schools, specialized interdisciplinary programs, but also strengthening the base and enhancing the student experience. Next, please. This is our um, this is our campus at Ulve. Uh, this is our startup campus, and it is. Uh, uh, spread across with uh, collaborative spaces, with uh, academic spaces, research labs, sports and recreational areas. It is uh, located in close proximity of the new international airport coming at Navi Mumbai and is very well connected um, to Navi Mumbai and South Mumbai. Uh, and there is a new ceiling, the MTHL, that will connect it uh, even better in, in coming years with South Mumbai. Uh, I'm sharing a few images. We are also planning a larger campus uh, in Navi Mumbai at Jonagiri, and uh, we'll talk about that later. So we are starting with the postgraduate programs in AI and data science and in digital media and marketing communication this year. And next year, we start a program, a postgraduate certificate program in sports management uh, with Dr. Bill Sutton as mentor, and Dr. Ashish and Dr. and, and Mr. Siddharth Shankar also helping us with the development of the program. Thank you, Naman. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Prina. Um, just a quick note to all the participants who have joined us. Throughout the session, please, we encourage you to ask as many questions as possible. Please use the Q&A tab that you can see on your screen to ask these questions. Um, it's easier for us to then uh, filter them from the chat messages that you're putting on the other tab. Uh, my only request with the questions is just keep them as brief as possible. So in the interest of time, we can take as many as possible after the session is done. I, I'd now like to invite Dr. Ashish Contractor, who is the Director of Rehabilitation Medicine and Sports Medicine at Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital, to give his opening remarks and also introduce our esteemed speaker for today's session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanjayan. So good evening, everyone. Or actually, as Sanjayan reminded us, I should say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, because... We have people from 18 countries today on this webinar. So very warm welcome today. Um, I'm going to spend literally two minutes talking about the vision related to sports and the Geo Institute before I formally institute, sorry, before I formally introduce Dr. Bill Sutton. As most of you in India at least know that sports is a very important aspect of the leadership's vision, both of the Geo Institute and RIL. We know that Srimati Neeta Ambani in fact, on Saturday, led the Indian contingent just two days ago 
and we won the bid to host the IOC, the International Olympic Committee sessions in Mumbai, India in 2023. This is the first time in the last 40 years that India is going to be hosting it. So I think that's a great achievement that we did, which we are celebrating. In terms of the sports vision for the Geo Institute, I think we can break it down into three large areas. First is the sports and academics. So we're going to have a lot of programs related to sports, sports management being the first one. We're going to look at sports medicine, exercise science, sports nutrition, sports psychology. We're going to work alongside the medical school and integrate the two and have a lot more offerings in the area of sports and academics. The second is to introduce world-class sporting infrastructure at an Indian university. We are right now working with master planners in the US to build some of the best stadiums that any university in India will have. And we're also looking to host a high performance center for sports, for sporting excellence to help in India's Olympic aspiration. And the third is to introduce a sporting culture among the university students. Everyone doesn't have to be an Olympic medalist, but it's important for everyone to have a sporting culture as, as part of their overall development. The Reliance Foundation has you know, put tremendous emphasis on sport right from the youth level, the RFYS, the Reliance Foundation Youth Sports, going all the way up to the Olympic level. So that's the vision for sports for the Geo Institute. Now it's my pleasure to formally introduce you to Dr. Bill Sutton. Dr. Sutton considers himself a pracademic. These are the words that he has used himself. That is someone who's been an academic for all his career, which has spanned 32 years. But amongst those 32 years, he spent 11 years actually working with professional sport. He currently holds an appointment as Professor Emeritus of Marketing and the Director of the Winnick Sport and Entertainment Management Graduate Program at the University of South Florida. And he's the founder and principal of Bill Sutton and Associates, a consulting firm in the area of sports management. He has also held academic appointments in the past at Robert Morris University, the Ohio State University, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, as well as the University of Central Florida. He is the co-author of two texts. One is known as Sport Marketing and Sport Promotion and Sales Management. And I know for a fact that these are known as the Bibles in the field of sports management by students. He has authored more than 300 articles in the field of sports management. And he's been a past president of the North American Society for Sports Management and a founding member and past president of the Sport Marketing Association and the Sport Marketing Quarterly. He's often called upon by leading publications such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, CNBC.com for his opinion on sporting matters. On the practical side, He's been the co-creator and architect of the innovative and groundbreaking sports sales combine, which CNBC.com hailed as, as a potentially next great idea in sports marketing. He has served as the vice president and business operations for National Basketball Association, the NBA. And in that capacity, Dr. Sutton assisted NBA teams with marketing related functions such as sales, promotional activities, market research, advertising and strategic planning and staffing. While he was at the NBA, he developed the team marketing and business operations department and strategy, which is widely acknowledged as the most successful team services approaches in professional sport. In terms of academics, he has had his entire education all the way up to PhD at the Oklahoma State University, where he was inducted in the College of Education Hall of Fame in the year 2003. He's also received a Distinguished Alumni Award from the university. He's also an inaugural member of the Robert Morris University Sports Management Hall of Fame and the Centenary University Sports Management Hall of Fame. Dr. Sutton resides in Tampa, Florida with his wife, Sharon. And let me give you just one quick insight on how we got in touch with, with Dr. Bill Sutton. A very close friend of mine, Dr. Matt Wilson, is a professor in sport management in the US and I reached out to him last year asking who would be the best mentor for this university program we want to set up. And his reply was in one line, and I'm going to quote him. He said, when it comes to sport management, there is no one bigger than Dr. Bill Sutton. So on that line, I hand you over to Dr. Bill Sutton for his very exciting lecture on the future of the sports management industry. Over to you, Bill. 
Thank you, Ashish, and, and thank you for the very generous introduction. Um, you, maybe you'll do my obituary someday. You could do me, you could do me well. Well, uh, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, in looking at the future, I've always closed my textbook with a chapter called Looking at the Future or My Predictions. And I was originally inspired when I was doing my dissertation at Oklahoma State. I found an article by, uh, per, by Mr. William O. Johnson, and it was written in 1974, and it was called Sport in the Year 2000. And so 26 years before, every one of his predictions came true except for one, and he had envisioned that there would be feel a vision, which would be you'd be watching on your television and you would be connected to some type of apparatus and you could feel what was going on with the athletes. You would actually feel like you were part of the game, which is a great idea unless you were playing American football and you got tackled. So we'll see where this goes, but I'm, I'm hoping you enjoy this. Uh, so let's start the slide presentation. Uh, this is a, this is the quote I live by. The quote or, or originated with George Bernard Shaw. And it's some men see things as they are and say, why I dream of things that never were and say, why not? Uh, when Robert Kennedy said this in 1968, I believe it was, I was 17 years old and very impressionable. And it inspired me. Uh, in fact, at the time, it inspired me to think I wanted to go into of going to politics, but uh, I think I'm glad, and I th I'm glad a lot of, I think a lot of other people are glad that I didn't make that decision. But it's always driven me, and for 30 years, it's been my, my mantra. But I decided, because of my respect for the Ambani family and their vision, that I would find another quote from George Bernard Shaw that I think really typifies the approach that the Ambani family have taken with Reliance and with GEO, and here's that quote from George Bernard Shaw. Imagination is the beginning of creation. You imagine what you desire, and you will what you imagine, and finally you create what you will. And I think that really describes what we're trying to build at GEO and what, what's been established with Reliance Family, Reliance Foundation, and the Ambani family, everything they've done. But I think it's a, a phenomenal quote to live by. Uh, next slide, please. So we've grouped my thoughts into a number of areas here, and we're going to cover these different areas in the presentation. And I'll be happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation, but we're also going to have an audience poll. And we'd like you to participate in the audience poll, and questions will come up, and you'll be able to respond, and we will share the results of the poll uh, later on. Next slide, please. Uh, I see a world where the Olympics have become overly political and full of controversy. And I think this last Olympics in, Be in Beijing has really driven that home, these Winter Olympics. In my world view, international competition like the FIFA World Cup will be emulated in other sports. And I feel the NBA is most likely to take the lead in developing these competitions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as NBA China, NBA India, and NBA Africa exist as to what is viewed as developmental leagues, similar to the NBA G League, there seems to be an opportunity to create a global competition that could be in the form of a tournament or a postseason playoff event, which might include the NBA League G League champion from the U.S. I could see an NBA Japan. I could see an NBA Australia New Zealand edition. And I could see some kind of a maybe – conglomeration of the European leagues to create an NBA Europe or an NBA all-star team from Europe that would play. And this would be a precursor for a basketball World Cup, which I think would have a lot of traction and a lot of interest. Now, whether or not it would be the NBA champion playing or it would be the G League champion playing would be determined. But I remember Manu Ginobili, who won a NBA championship with the San Antonio Spurs saying at the time when, when he was asked about how it felt being a world champion, 
he just smiled and said, I'm an NBA champion. I'm not sure if we're the world champion. And that, that challenge is out there and we need to figure it out because I think that everyone would love to see how their the best teams in their country or their best countrymen besides the Olympics would do in a, a basketball world cup. Next slide, please. This just shows how the NBA has moved on and how it's been successful. And I can remember in the early 1970s where the NBA finals, now I'm talking about the finals, were not broadcast live throughout the United States. They were on what was called at the time tape delay. So when you were watching the 11 o'clock news in the United States and the sports announcer came on, he would say, I'm going to give the score of the NBA finals game tonight, which we're going to show on tape delay after the show. If you don't want to know the score, leave the room. And that's where the NBA was in the early 70s. And now let's see where the NBA is today. It's, it's incredible, the vision. And I, I had the opportunity to work for Commissioner Stern. And I would have to tell you, he is the most, he was, he was the most brilliant man I've ever met. And he was so intuitive in the, he, although he was trained as a lawyer, he was so intuitive in marketing. And we would ask him one time, do you think we should have a CMO? And his response was, I am the CMO. And he had an amazing vision, an amazing feel for his constituency, an amazing way of conducting business. And uh, he really impacted the league and brought it forward. So it's really in, in my estimation, well, in everyone's estimation, it's the number two league in the United States, but it could be the number two league in the world after, after FIFA. Next slide, please. And this is just my little graphic of where I see this competition and how interesting it could be. Uh, next slide. Uh, you know, my youngest son, Daniel, works for Tencent owned Riot Games, which has produced the most popular video game in the world, League of Legends. And as of January 22, there are 180 million active players every month. If you think about it, that dwarfs a lot of the other things that, that we talk about. It dwarfs a lot of the other sports. And what esports has done, it's, it's, it's evolved in, in several different ways that I find very, very interesting. Um, the first way is, you know, we have sports e-games and we have fantasy e-games. The esports games are very good. FIFA has one. The NBA has one, Major League Baseball has one, the NFL has one, they're, they exist everywhere. But they're limited in their ability to challenge the player. Once you've achieved your skill level, your game is really dependent upon the opponent, how, how well the, play, the opponent you have, are playing against plays. Whereas in the fantasy games, you're also playing against the game itself and how the game evolves and how the game has different levels. And this is, you might find this interesting, but before my son, my son had been working at Google and had accepted this job at Riot. And he was told at the time, which is about seven years ago, that he, he couldn't start the job until he reached level, I think it was level 30 on League of Legends because they wanted to make sure all their employees understood the game and the passion of the fans for the game and, and everything that goes into the game. They wanted all their people to really understand that, which I thought was really interesting at the time. Next slide, please. Uh, the esports ecosystem is on track to surpass a billion in revenue, with North America said to hit 300 million by 2022. Korea, Japan, China are leaders in this space. Viewership is expected to increase by 192 million in the next two years. I've already given you the, the stat on League of Legends. The NBA 2K is 30 million, FIFA is 9 million. Um, it just shows what you have here. But what I think I really like about esports is that esports is innately organic and innately global that I can play anyone in the world when I sit down at my computer. I'm, I'm linked, I'm connected via this game. And so my competition and my growth and my experiences are, are amazing. 
And I think that as, as children have evolved from different forms of sport and esport and the, pr the primitive efforts of Atari and, and television and different things, that this has gone on. Now, now, I've been criticized because I say that this could threaten participatory sports. And people question that and they point out to me that what makes participatory sport like soccer and like or football or basketball is that the parent has played the game and can share the game with their child. And I point out that esports is relatively new and the people that grew up playing esports are just now becoming parents and they will be sharing esports with their children. So this will happen. So this is just one of my predictions. Um, you know, I hope you enjoy it and, and, and smile. I hope I made you smile thinking about this, or maybe I made you afraid thinking about this because you're worried that your son or daughter will close off playing the real sports and, and want to just play the esports. So let's move on to the next slide. So what I just raised to you is the personification of what you're going to see here. Can you translate through augmented reality or virtual reality? Can you transform e-games into real action sports? So let's take a look at this video. And I think we're going to get there. I think this is this is a reality. This is fun. This is, you know, if you've ever seen paintball, this is paintball only in a virtual world. And I think it's it's fun to imagine what our games could look like. I think it's fun to imagine that I wouldn't need necessarily, oh, 22 people to play football, or I wouldn't need different, different requirements physically to have, have the game. And I think as we grow, we're going to see these things. And I just think this is a, a really interesting outgrowth, a per perception of what could be. And as we go through this, this, this uh, presentation today, you're going to see several perceptions that were actually predictive perceptions of what we think things were going to look like. And again, watching those evolve, those are going to be fun for you to see. So uh, let's go to the next slide. Now, one thing that every sports team and sport league wants are ways to engage their fans. And this has been going on for a long time. 71 years ago in the United States, Bill Veck, who's in the Baseball Hall of Fame, had the last place St. Louis Browns, and they were a woeful team, and they would finish in last place at the end of the year. And so everyone would be calling Bill Vec. You didn't have email then. You'd be calling Bill Vec or sending a letter saying, your team is so bad, I could manage that team. I could do better. I could make better decisions. So he decided that he was going to create a grandstand manager's night, and he was going to invite 1,000 fans to sit in the stands and make every decision related to playing the game, a real Major League Baseball game. They would, make it, they would make the lineup out. They would make every strategy, every, every call, should they change the pitcher, should they steal a base, should they pit and run. All the strategies of baseball were all done with these yes and no cards. Now, what I think is most interesting about this is that one of the biggest complaints about baseball in the United States is it takes too long to play. And I'm sure you've heard that about traditional cricket. It's too long. We don't know. It's just too long. So I find it interesting that this game 
that was played in 1951 took an hour and 56 minutes to play. And current baseball games are almost three hours or over three hours to play. And this is letting the fans have all this participation. Now, what do you think happened? Well, in a, in a, in a, in a fairy tale world, the St. Louis Browns would win the game. And that's exactly what happened. The fans made the decisions and the team won the game. However, there was a lot of criticism about making a mockery of the game and the strategy of the game. So after this was done, immediately afterwards, Major League Baseball passed a rule that this couldn't happen. So there it went. And it sat dormant until recently in the U.S. where we've created the fan-controlled football league, which uses technology to let fans do exactly what Bill Vec did in 1951. So let's show that video to let people see an idea of how the fan-controlled football league would work. Inner offensive coordinator. The fan controlled football league is coming. Giving fans the power they've always wanted. Fourth down, big play. What are you calling? I'm going to pass. We still got 11 yards to go. I don't want to see him kick yet. I want to see him pass it in. Lots of pressure. Oh, Looking oh. deep into the end zone. Yes, Touchdown. Oh. What a great fan Hold play, though. What a great fan play, though. Here's how it works. You call the plays in real time via the FCFL mobile app or directly on Twitch. In the mobile app, four diagram play options with a countdown timer will appear. Gotta think quick. Do you run? Do you pass? Gadget play perhaps? Your vote can tip the scales. On Twitch, fans will see the following overlay with the same play options. Votes will be tallied in real time and the fans choice will be highlighted. The coach will immediately see the results on his iPad. Next, the quarterback will huddle with his troops and execute the fan's call. Now this is where it gets real and intense. Professional football takes over. And Mr. Dawson down there with the touchdown. Oh, that's fantastic. How great is that? Fans call it a great play. If fans hey, you get stuck. two in the win at the end of regulation, well, that's what they get. Oh my God, are you kidding me right now? If you the slide. fans that voted for the successful play, you rack up the stats. Now, this looks like a lot of fun. It hasn't been it hasn't been that popular, and the criticism is very similar to Vec that the coaches and the players don't want to feel like pieces on a chessboard. They they want the autonomy to move and make decisions. So we'll see where this goes. But in the meantime, we're going to be limited to fantasy sports, which have, have grown immeasurably and uh, will continue to do so. It's a great way of connecting fans to their favorite sport, to their favorite players. And the great thing about fantasy sport in the U.S., and I'm sure it's that way all around the world, is that for the league, from the league perspective, when you have players on your fantasy team from different, different teams within the league, you'll watch more games, you'll follow more teams because you'll follow your player, and thus your connection and your level of engagement becomes much, much greater. Now, there's also something that's happened in the U.S. that I'm predicting, and it happened in Europe before this, it's happened in the U.S. now, and I predict it will come to India and Asia, and, and that's the next slide. Uh, those two pictures are the FanDuel Sports Lounge at the Phoenix Suns NBA team. So it's an on-site sports book or betting parlor where you can go, not, not just during games, but seven days a week and bet on different sporting events. So the Suns sold a sponsorship to FanDuel. And they also get a percentage of the revenue that's being generated. 
and it's called the handle. And the sun's current take of the handle, and only after six months, is right around $900,000 a month. So it's become a real revenue stream. But as you are familiar, there are a lot of issues with, with gambling. Next slide, please. 48% uh, of American adults said they have some interest in sports betting. 45.9 people participate in fantasy sports worldwide. And the size of online sports gambling market worldwide is 58.9 billion US dollars. So it's a lot, a lot, a lot of revenue that people aren't going to want to pass up. So in the United States, we're divided into 50 states. And each state can control whether or not gambling is legal in, within their state. And in some, some uh, states like Florida and Arizona, the Native American tribes have had the right to control gambling. And so they've been challenged now by the MGM and FanDuel and DraftKings and other, other betting companies. But to get the legislation passed to approve sports betting, uh, it's been compared to what we call in the US a sin tax, where we have a tax on tobacco, we have a tax on alcohol, and now we have a tax on gambling. And the, a portion of the proceeds from the sin tax are allocated for the greater good, whether that be uh, education or senior citizens or whatever it might be. And, you know, I had made a suggestion in Arizona, when Arizona was putting it up for uh, debate as to whether or not it was going to pass where the Phoenix Suns reside, the Phoenix Suns are one of the clients I work with. I had suggested that the Suns talk to their legislator and say that possibly a percentage of the revenue could be used for COVID proofing schools and COVID proofing programs and pandemic related things. And that was, that became part of the, a part of the revenue split. So it's important that you're gonna do something good with the revenue. We know that gambling like alcohol and like tobacco is addictive and we have to have preventive programs in place. And there's always a commercial in the arena or when you go, it's a disclaimer that this could be addictive and you need to Here's if, if somebody you know is addicted, here's a number to call and get them help. But, you know, as I say to people all the time, I said, you know, you have to understand what you're doing here. The sports book I showed you on the last slide, that's, you walk in and, you're, you know, if it's in a, a lounge like that, you have to be a certain age to enter it. But you know that it's going on. And so there's nothing that really stops a parent and child, a child coming in and saying, hey, let's bet that LeBron will have 30 points tonight. So the recreational aspect of betting is going to introduce people to betting at a much earlier age. And it's something that we're going to have to contend with as a society. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the stadium and match experience has undergone a drastic transformation since COVID in 2020, drastic. And what I mean by that is a lot of the things that we were experimenting with, we were experimenting with cashless systems, we were experimenting with paperless. We were able to take COVID and implement those programs by saying, we're not going to be handling paper tickets. And we're not going to be handling cash. So everything is going to be paperless and cashless. It became the norm rather than the exception. And it didn't have to be coming in gradually. It came in drastically that we implemented it right away. And Clear, uh, a company that was specializing at the time in airport security, came up with a program, it's, it's bio-related, uh, came up with a medical mobile health screening and vaccination validation, and it, it produced a credential for admission into a sports event. So you had a health pass from Clear saying that you had had your vaccination and your booster shots. So it became, you know, the documentation. Rather than have to whip out your vaccination card or show a, a picture on your phone, this sped up the process. You could take your clear card, scan it, and you were admitted in the building. Uh, it's integrated with a number of different laboratories and, and human API. 
and it can conduct a health survey and it's privacy protected. Next slide, please. But clear understanding that there's more of an application than just the health aspects. You can track fan data and drive business impact through increased repeat visit rates and per caps. You can measure everything as you scan your clear card. Provided touchless ticketing, like we talked about, age validation, touchless payment, biometric payment and entry. It reduced operational event staffing costs after you made the initial expense to get the technology for the scanners. It was already in use at 50 plus airports, venues, and stadiums. In fact, Clear had been in play in the U.S. in the late 90s, I'm sorry, in the early 2000s, and then went away when TSA came out and now has relaunched itself with the medical app to try and gain that market share again. So this is always going to be there. I'm, I'm, I'm anticipating cruise ships. I'm anticipating any time concerts, anything with an admission or you're gonna be concerned about the danger of COVID or another type of pandemic illness, you can, you're gonna to have to have some kind of a proof and uh, clear there is a credential that kind of lets you have that. I've also thought, and this is me speculating, and Ashish, this is more in your realm as well, but I could see teams having a chief health officer and the chief health officer work, would work with the venue and work with the team, first of all, to make sure all the players were healthy, but also to be concerned about fan health through different things in the venue. Now, I had a cruise book on Viking Cruise Line, and I got a email from the chairman of Viking Cruise Lines saying, I know you're concerned about COVID, here's what we're doing. And he took us on a tour of the boat showing that they were they had a lab built on the boat to do daily COVID testing. They showed robot cleaners that would work through the night to clean the boat. They showed different types of lighting and they showed different types of sanitation. So we're aggressively tackling this in the sport and recreation area because we have all these events that draw a lot of people and put those people in close proximity. So I would continue to see this kind of thing growing and happening, but I could see a chief health officer. Next slide, please. All right, if you watch the Super Bowl, this is where the Super Bowl was held. This is a $5 billion complex with the most unbelievable technology and video displays, but it's also part of a larger mass. Uh, next slide, please. Capacity is about 70,000. It's the largest video board in sports, which you see with it. It's being shown there, a circular board with the San Diego Chargers logo or the LA Chargers logo in it. It takes up about 300 acres. It can be indoor or outdoor with the roof and it has world-class hospitality. In addition, it has retail complexes, apartment complexes, business complexes, and an unbelievable uh, egress and access system for people to access it on non-game days to do different things in the complex, not in the stadium itself. Um, but there's a looming question here, and it kind of goes through what we're going to talk about coming up. And I'm going to I'm going to pose the question to you now, and I want you thinking about it as we go through the next set of the next partial rest of the presentation. Is that is there going to be a need for seventy thousand seat stadiums? Or are people going to attend through the metaverse or attend virtually? And that's going to necessitate the, or eliminate the need for these large stadiums that not everybody's going to want to go or not everybody's going to need to go and not everybody has access to go. But there could be significant people watching the event when it takes place that aren't necessarily in that building. So we will talk about that later on. Uh, next slide, please. Um, every building in the U.S. and most throughout the world have what are called suites. And suites are pre a premium seating option. And uh, it's, it looks like basically like a, a small living room with, with food service and then seats in outside the living area that go into the 
the sporting venue for you to watch the game. It's primarily been used for entertainment and for people to huddle up on cooler days, but it plays a role. And I'm seeing that as, as the world has changed, these are all always paid for out of client entertainment budgets. And that's kind of fallen into disfavor. And so I was, I have been promoting for a while now the idea that, and I will tell you, I've been struggling. My idea has not caught on, but I firmly believe in it, is that we need to change the idea of a suite to become a business activation center because they're primarily used for business, but they're entertaining clients. Why can't you entertain clients in a very creative way that showcases your product? To do this, owners would have to have access to their, their suite 24-7, 365, which makes it more of a real estate play rather than an event play. And if they do this, suites will become an extension of the brand in the showroom, thus taking on a new look and a function. So I'm gonna show you some pictures of traditional suites and then some concepts that I have and then some app applications of what I'm talking about here, how the, how the brand can become more activated. So let's go to the next slide. This is a slide at the, Am at the uh, Amway Center in Orlando, Florida, home of the Orlando Magic. You see what I said? It's like a small little living area and there's a buffet table with food and wine. And then the counter in the front looks out into the arena and then there's 12 to 20 seats in front of that counter. That's a traditional suite, okay? And most teams have anywhere from 50 to 250 or even 300 of these for sale, ranging anywhere from 100,000 to $2 million a year. So it's, it's big business. Next slide, please. This is one of my concepts that I could have a suite Cold Stone Creamery is an ice cream company in the United States. And to me, if I had a suite like this, everybody that's on the suite level could come by and get a sample of my ice cream, which is my business. So I'm using it as my totally test center to expose people to my product outdoor. So it's, it's, the, it's this one set up that it's on the concourse. I still have whatever inside, but I have this test center, a test kitchen, and I can actually have a test kitchen inside for people to come and, and see what I have. But it's a way of integrating my business into the game. Next slide. This one probably has a higher likelihood of happening. I call this my Xbox suite. And so I have gaming chairs for people to sit in rather than regular seats. And I have screens for people to play the video games while they're there. And what I proposed is that in this suite, I would have the latest technology, the latest games, the latest hardware that isn't even available on the market yet. So it's kind of futuristic. And so if you're invited to the suite, you're gonna see all these different things. And you're gonna try them out before anybody else, which makes it very attractive to go there. And you also looked at, if you're looking up from the bowl, if you look in a modern arena right now, every suite looks the same. This suite would look different. And that's also part of my thing is to find, to get a natural curiosity about people in the arena saying, what's going on there? What is that? Next slide, please. This one's my favorite. This is a Harley Davidson suite I, I, I envisioned where it's all branded Harley Davidson. And there's a table actually going across those Harleys where you sit on the Harley instead of sitting at a chair at a counter. And my vision was that everyone that was invited to the Harley suite would get a coupon for a free weekend rental of a Harley when they leave the building. So they have it maybe three months to use their free weekend rental of a Harley. And again, my, my vision is if this is your brand and this is your product, how better to bring that brand to life than through sport, have people see the Harleys in the suite and then be able to go out and rent a Harley and, and have a great weekend and enjoy it. So that's my vision. Those are my visions. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some things that actually happened. Next slide, please. This is a rendering of what eventually became 
Southwest Airlines, but this was when the Orlando Magic was building the building, this is going to be the AirTran flight deck. And it was going to be a suite that was pretty much going to be laid out like an airplane. So it gave you the experience of what business class would be on the airplane in the suite. Next slide, please. So you would enter the suite just like you would enter an airplane. There would be a hostess there to meet you and take you in. Next slide, please. There's the, there's the hostess meeting you, checking your boarding pass, if you will, and allowing you to enter the suite. Next slide, please. And we have seats, as you can see on the left, seats set up like an airplane, tall seats that recline, that are hooked up for headphones, hooked up for personal things. We had overhead compartments for you to store your belongings. Next slide, please. Um, and that, hold on to the slide for a second, but that slide, AirTran, that actually was built and then it became Southwest Airlines. And then they repurposed the space for another sponsor later on. But that was an actual concept that did what I did and took it there. Now, these are some suites in Europe. This is an EA Sports suite, pretty much like I showed you before with my Xbox suite. Next slide, please. This is the Ferrari suite in Shanghai. The colors are red, Ferrari's colors, all types of history. There's, a, there's an, an interactive wall showing the history of Ferrari. There are different models, but there's no Ferrari seats. There's no Ferrari model in the, in the suite, but it is moving in the right direction. And I think it's really important that you understand that a suite can be viewed as real estate. It can be viewed as event space. It can be viewed as entertainment. It can be viewed as a business development space, but also a fan experience space. And when you take all those concepts together, you come up with things like this rather than that first living room type suite that I showed you. Uh, next slide, please. Now we're gonna get into some, some of the more futuristic aspects of the presentation that I think are, are gonna happen and I'm excited about them. Uh, how are we using blockchain? Well, crypto sponsorships, we can tokenize athletes. We have smart tickets. We can decentralize ticket resale. We can share performance data securely like the uh, clear I showed you. We can decentralize fantasy sports, transparent drug testing, fan revenue sharing, which is interesting. It's a concept. I don't know if that, that one's still a ways off. Rewarding fan interaction, which everybody has been trying to figure that out for, for years with loyalty programs sports streaming services and sharing information with fans, which I think is one of the more critical things here if we tie in fantasy sports and sports betting. Next slide, please. Um, an NFT is, is, is probably a really good application of blockchain. And an NFT is a non-fungible token. It's a unique unit of data that employs technology that allows digital content from images to songs to videos, and the content is logged and authenticated on cryptocurrency blockchain, which makes it easy to own, easy to collect, and sell that digital content. Now, what I will tell you about NFT is NFT is tied into cryptocurrency, but like cryptocurrency, it isn't really readily understood the value of it. Some people really understand it well, like Tom Brady in the United States has done his own NFTs and released those. Teams are starting to do this. Leagues are starting to do this. It's replaced trading cards. It's active in the art industry where people can have a painting and, and buy an artist's work and digitize it and share it and be able to project it at home. But show this video, which will give you an idea of what, what teams in the NBA are doing right now. Welcome to the future. Introducing Jess XR, our first ever NFT offering. A new era of virtual experiences awaits. Metaverse activated. Unit number one, two, three, two, two, one. Code name Jazz. Are you ready for the draw?
NFT number 001. Experience unlocked. Join your favorite Utah jazz icons in a state-of-the-art virtual locker room. Designed by world-renowned NFT artist Krista Kim. Enter with your favorite device. Use the arrow keys to explore. And toggle the microphone button to speak in real time. You are now entering the virtual locker room. Jazz XR. Experience a whole new world. I think I think it's a really interesting application of an NFT because a lot of the NFTs are just photos that have been digitized. This is an actual interactive experience. Now, I'm particularly interested in this one because 15 years ago, the Phoenix Suns had a virtual locker room that was nowhere near this type of technology, but they had it sponsored by a grocery store, Fry's Grocery Store. And as you took the virtual tour, you would come into contact with different Fry's products that were used throughout the locker room, like cleaning products and, and food items and different things like that. And I thought that was a genius application. So I would see sponsorship application for this virtual arena tour and different things to generate revenue from the NFT besides the initial subscription to the NFT, or it could be made free to the fans by the sponsor. Fed 3 billion in sales in 2021, first and quarter two. Um, and it's growing as people understand it and, and, and can value it. And we start moving away and, and you know, more digital content. I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm old, I'm 71. And I remember when the iPod came out, which was digitized music and it made it portable and it made it convenient. And this is what this does. It's portable, it's convenient, it's digital. You can access it whenever you want and you own it. So it's kind of interesting. We'll see where it goes, but it's growing. We'll see more and more of it. We'll see more experimentation. Individual athletes and artists are using it quite extensively. And some teams are, are like the Jazz are doing it and doing their own thing. And you'll see some leagues doing it. And so what I eventually see is somebody trying to figure out in the NBA, they share basketball related income with the players. The players get roughly 57 cents out of every American dollar. If an NFT is basketball related income, that would fall into that space. As of yet, it hasn't. And the players have their own and they can control it. So we'll see where this evolves to. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you know, this one has been the one that I'm the most intrigued by because we've been teased by this for years and years and years and years. And that's virtual reality and augmented reality. And obviously there are gonna be ways to experience a game in the future. And I have said, oh, for at least 15 years, I have said, if you could sell a virtual reality ticket to, see the, to sit at courtside and see the Golden State Warriors play, I thought the market would be maybe 500 million people globally would buy that ticket. And if you think about that, go back to the slide, go back to the thought of, remember I told you that 70,000 seat stadium. If you have a potential of, let's say even 10 million people watching your event virtually, should, we, should your emphasis be on the arena or should your emphasis be on that audience? And I think we're gonna progress where we're gonna look more and more to the audience as other health concerns and other things rise up where you might not want to go in person. Uh, even though for years, we've always been talking about what it's, how important it is to be there, be at the game in person. But, you know, there's going to be ways that we can do this. If you could view the game from courtside, or maybe you can view it, maybe what I do is if you're at home, I let you view the game from courtside. If you're in the arena, Maybe we have something where you can watch it from the player's perspective. You can watch it from the point guard in a basketball game. You can watch it from a forward in a football match. You can watch it from the pitcher in a cricket match. I mean, there's a lot of different ways this could be, and it might be really interesting. The point is, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. I mean, Oculus is great, but, you know, to me, the Rubicon – when we cross the Rubicon for VR, that Rubicon is gonna be what Google Glass was intended to be. Lightweight, convenient, easy to use, not encumbersome. 
and uh, you can wear it for an extended period of time. So that's what I'm waiting on. I am waiting on the evolution of the eyepiece, if you will, to see where we really end up with this. So um, I want to show you a couple of clips of, of what we thought VR was going to be. So next slide, please. Okay, this is from the Michael Crichton novel, Disclosure, which was made into a movie. I think it was 1983. And this has been the view of VR that I have always tied into. This was the, one of the first things I ever saw. And I thought, man, is this cool? I want to do this. So let's show this clip. Remember, 1983. Access Digicom's Corridor, our prototype for a virtual reality database. Enjoy the demonstration. All information accessed during this demonstration is for entertainment value only and should not be duplicated or fed to another database. If you have any questions, please ask the angel. Okay, you can stop this. You can stop this one. All right, that's 1984's vision of virtual reality. Let's go to the next slide, which gives us 2018's version. This is from the film Ready Player One. These days, reality is a bummer. Everyone's looking for a way to escape, and that's why Halliday. That's why he was such a hero to us. He showed us that we could go somewhere without going anywhere at all. You don't need a destination when you're running on an omnidirectional treadmill with quadraphonic pressure sensitive underlay. James Halliday saw the future and then he built it. He gave us a place to go, a place called the Oasis. This is the Oasis. It's a place where the limits of reality are your own imagination. You can do anything. Go anywhere. Like the vacation planets. Surf a 50-foot monster wave in Hawaii. You can ski down the pyramids. You can climb Mount Everest with Batman. Check out this place. It's a casino the size of a planet. You can lose your money there. You can get married. You can get divorced. You can, you can go in there. People come to the Oasis for all the things they can do. But they stay because of all the things they can be. Tall, beautiful. Okay. 
Scary. You can stop this. Sex, a different species. Now, that brings us to 2022 and Zuckerberg and the metaverse. And the metaverse is a fully realized digital world that exists outside the world we live in. And it combines VR with a, a digital second life. And according to Matthew Ball, it's the fourth wave of computers. The first wave being mainframe back in the day. The second wave being personal. The third wave being mobile. And the fourth wave is ambient. Ambient is being within the computer rather than having access to it. Being always online through your avatar. So we've got a couple of the metaverse clips here. Let's take, a, let's take a brief look at a couple of these. Go ahead, start it. Imagine you put on your glasses or headset and you're instantly in your home space. It has parts of your physical home recreated virtually. It has things that are only possible virtually. And it has an incredibly inspiring view of whatever you find most beautiful. Hey, are you coming? Yeah, just got to find something to wear. All right, perfect. Ooh, boy. <laughs> oh, hey, Mark. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Hi. Mark. Hi, Mark. What's up, Mark? Whoa, we're floating in space? Uh -huh. Who made this place? It's <laughs> awesome. Right? It's from a crater. I met in L.A. Uh, this place is amazing. <laughs> Boz, is that you? Of course it's me. You know I had to be the robot, man. I thought I was supposed to be the robot. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> I knew you were bluffing. <laughs> hey, wait. Where is Naomi? Let's yes, call her. Naomi. <laughs> hey, should we deal you in? Sorry, I'm running late, but you've got to see what we're checking out. There's an artist going around Soho hiding AR pieces for people to find. 3D street art? That's cool. Send that link over so we can all look at it. This is stunning. Okay, that is something. That's awesome. Wow. I love the movement. Wait, it's, it's disappearing. This is amazing. Hold on. I'll tip the artist and they'll extend it. Wow. Brilliant. Privacy and safety need to be built into the metaverse from day one. You'll get to decide when you want to be with other people, when you want to block someone from appearing in your space, or when you want to take a break and teleport to a private bubble to be alone. You're going to be you able to now. bring things from the physical world into the metaverse. Almost. All right, the next clip is, is metaverse at work. And I'll show just a, a brief portion of this as well so you, so you get the idea and a half a lot of us who work in offices have gone remote and while i miss seeing the people i work with i think remote work is here to stay for a lot of people so we're going to need better tools to work together let's take a look at what working in the metaverse will be like imagine if you could be at the office without the commute you would still have that sense of presence shared physical space those chance interactions that make your day all accessible from anywhere now imagine that you have your perfect work setup and you can actually do more than you could in your regular work setup. And on top of all that, you can keep wearing your favorite sweatpants. And as we focused more on work, and frankly, as we've heard your feedback more broadly, we're working on making it so you can log into Quest with an account other than your personal Facebook account. We're starting to stop support this support for work accounts soon, and we're working. Now, what I found really, really interesting about that last section is it's today because the number one complaint that I get from people working in the sport industry is they miss the people that they work with, but they do enjoy being at home and working from home. So how do you combine that? And if the metaverse comes to be what Zuckerberg thinks it can be, that alleviates that concern. Now, a lot of the clients I have in the sports industry right now are working hybrid models, probably three days in the office, two days out. And I always say we're working remotely. We're not necessarily working from home because for some people, working from home to a boss might be you're in your pajamas playing with your dog and they don't want to hear that. So we say working remotely. But I think, I think we're going to continue to have a hybrid model of work 
And in the sports industry, it's challenging because we have games and we have entertainment, we have schedules and we play. I tell people all the time, we work where and when other people play. And so we've got to take all this into account, but it might be interesting in a metaverse kind of world, how that would evolve as well. But you know, the avatar concept is not a lot different than Fortnite and League of Legends when you're using an avatar and, and, or playing a character to begin with. So there is some familiarity there. But I think what the metaverse has, it's going to be a challenge for some people, not for others, is it's a total immersion. And it's existing simultaneously with your real life. You're in a digital world and your real world. And that's going to take some getting used to. But if you grow up in it, it could, it could be much, much, much easier. So we'll see where it goes. But I wanted you to see where we thought about AR and VR over the years. And, you know, it's, you know, I always say it would be nice if virtual reality was a reality. And we're not there yet. We're really not there yet. But we are moving along and things are happening. And we've got little bits and snippets and experiments and trials that we can use. Next slide, please. Um, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about, because, because I'm so into the Embody family and the Reliance model and increasing sport in India and the sport participation, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I could see happening in India through some grassroots level marketing. So go ahead, next slide, please. Uh, the sport I hit on was badminton, and I hit on it for an interesting reason. We ask a poll question as to what, what sport is the most popular sport in India after cricket. And we'll share that in a, in a bit. But the success of badminton in the 2020 Olympics and Paralympic Games played a key role in the growth of the sport. There's a badminton world federation that's developed an app called badminton for you designed to offer content and bring playing community closer to the action. There's 50 million badminton players playing at least five times a year in India, but that only represents a half of 1% of the population. So in my estimation, this is fertile area for a grassroots attempt. Next slide, please. So when I think of, of grassroots attempt, I think of Alexander Spalding in the 1880s in the United States without any media support at all, okay? He used an approach, and this is a picture of him taking baseball to Egypt and playing in the desert in front of the pyramids, which was probably more of a spectacle than a reality, but it, was, it, it grew the demonstration. Next slide, please. But Spalding used free clinics to teach and, demonst and demonstrate and teach the game. He had touring exhibitions of professional staging matches with these clinics. He, he, he was a sponsorship tie-in and he was the equipment manufacturer and he would provide equipment at the clinics and enable people to try it because he sold it. It was his basic business. You can make badminton part of the school physical education curriculum as a lifetime sport. And you could also have a website for teachers and beginners containing lessons and other teaching roles. Next slide, please. Um, before we go to this, I want to talk about just just sum up my Spalding thing. Spalding was a professional baseball player that wanted that had the rights to produce the baseball, the actual ball used in play. So he was manufacturing it, and the only way he could sell baseballs was to teach people how to play baseball. So his whole approach was, if I get more players. I have more of a market. And he did this with bicycles and a number of other things. And as I mentioned to Ashish and Sid the other day, what astounds me the most is that Spalding was the first sporting goods company in the United States. And now it's, it's a footnote. It's irrelevant. Wilson is the, the new basketball, even though Spalding made the first basketball. Spalding made the first baseball. They did a lot of firsts, but they never evolved as a company. They didn't grow. They didn't change with the times. And so they lost out. And so I just wanted to point that out as because as, we're talking about the future. And, and one of the most essential things about being a futurist is the ability to change, the ability to evolve, and the ability to anticipate what's next. 
So let's talk about employment opportunities in the next decade. And I say, we're gonna look for explorers. And why do I use the term explorers? I say, because we're gonna look for somebody to take us somewhere we haven't been before or to do something we haven't done before or to think about something we haven't thought about before or to play something we haven't played before. Next slide, please. So the most popular jobs now and going in the future are gonna be data analysts. Uh, I've seen data analysts go from two to three a team to 15 a team. Web developers, e-marketers, service and retention specialists, graphic designers, content creators, salespeople, and of course, imagineers using the Disney term. People that can just see an opportunity and try and fill the hole. Next slide. I've had a lot of fun putting this together. I've had a lot of fun working with the people at GEO to do this. Um, but the, the, the future is, is the reality. We have to be thinking about how we can be better, how we can be more innovative, how we can take the resources that we have and maximize those resources, how we can anticipate needs and interests, and how we can really become truly global. Uh, you know, not just talk about being truly global, but be global. Uh, I appreciate your time, your interest, and I'll take any questions anyone has. Thank you so much, Dr. Bill. I, it was a very enriching talk, and I believe a lot of the audience was exposed to a lot of things that uh, they did not have too much idea about. Even the videos, the references that we use. So thank you for that. We actually have a lot of questions, and we don't have a lot of time. So I'm, I'll try and just take as many as I can. So uh, firstly, um, what are the factors that uh, India should focus upon so that it can become a contributor to this revolution in the sports industry? What should India focus on? I think India needs to do an assessment of what's important to the people in India. Where, where is esports going to be? How is that going to evolve? How is that going to play? Is, is football the next sport to cricket? Is it basketball? You know, NBA India has made a sizable investment. They spent 10 years. They're trying to grow the game. They're trying, trying to develop people through youth, the youth game and move them into the academies and hopefully sooner or later into the NBA. I, I think you really need to do an assessment of what's important to the people in India, where they want to be, where they need to go, what could happen, and then to be able to, to come up with a game plan to put that into effect. And the game plan is going to be a combination of grassroots and technology. So uh, you spoke a lot, uh, Doctor, about uh, the VR experience and how this can be the next big thing in sports. There were a lot of questions around that. I'll try and combine uh, two, three in just one question if I can. So I think mm -hmm. one part of the question is that how much can it emulate a real game experience? Is it the same as sitting in a stadium with 70,000 people and experiencing this? And the other side of it is, if yes, what is the business side of this? Because courtside tickets are very expensive. So how do you monetize this whole situation then? Very much. Okay, for the first part of it, uh, the thing missing when you're watching something virtually is the social aspect. If you're not there with the game, you have no one to socialize with. So in his metaverse concept, Zuckerberg talks about being able to attend a sporting event with your avatar, with your friend's avatars, and to be able to interact and discuss. So if that comes to be, that could be a reality. Um, but in the interim, a virtual season ticket, you could still invite your friends and share the virtual season ticket and be in your own living room and share it. But the social aspect of it cannot be under, 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 undervalued because that's really the driver. People like to socialize. They like to talk about sports. They like to compare their experiences. They like to dish out, you know, criticism to their opponents and, and give each other a hard time. All that stuff has to happen. So we need to take that into account. Now, monetization, I mean, the, the great thing about virtual is that there, there aren't any physical limitations. So if I had, let's say I had 100 million Golden State subscribers worldwide to sit courtside. Well, I could charge, you know, 100 US dollars and make quite a profit. I could charge 50 US dollars and still make quite a profit. So the scale of the virtual universe is, is what dictates the monetization. But it also dictates the access, which tells you how much, you know, how, how much, you, how, how many people you can have and where you can go. I mean, when I've been in England, I've seen people get up at four o'clock in the morning to watch a US football game at four o'clock in the morning. 
Well, wouldn't they rather come downstairs, have a cup of coffee and just watch it virtually with their friends instead of going down to the pub, which takes the, the social aspect out of it. So, I mean, again, it's that fine line between allowing the access to anything you want, but being able to figure out a way to, to have it socially and not just sitting on your second screen and emailing someone or talking about it, but actually to, to feel that you're with those people. And that's where the metaverse thing is going to really impact this. So interestingly, you mentioned a little bit about the social component. So there's one more question related to the social component of VR. So if I can experience a lot of VR related sporting activities, and that's something I like, and that's something that the future generation likes, uh, where do we draw the line between them actually going out playing and learning sport? Because it cannot become a replacement for learning sport. And that's the challenge. The challenge is, you know, I love the slide where I showed taking the esports game and making it physical. And that's the challenge. That's what we have to get. We have to use the esports and the virtual experience as a motivator, as an enhancement, as a, a way of growing the game for people to participate. But we have to make it attractive. We have to think about things. You know, like, you know, basketball has done a great job of coming up with three on three basketball. So if you don't have if you don't have 10 people and you have six people, you can play basketball. Soccer's done the same thing. Hockey's done some things in their all-star game playing three on three. Sports have to adapt to changing populations, changing interests, and they need to make their game. I want to use, I'm going to steal from McDonald's. I'm going to say we have to make it bite-sized. We have to make it small enough that anyone can participate in it, regardless of their economic stature regardless of the number of people we're with and regardless of the physical space. So, you know, I used to remember playing instead when we didn't have enough people to play baseball, we went in with tennis court and we used a plastic ball and a plastic bat played within the tennis court. And we just downsized the game to fit our needs at the time. And we adapted. And I haven't seen that level of imagination to the playing side of the game. I've seen it for the video side of the game. And I've seen it for the technology side, our, our, our visualization and the way we think about things is outstanding, but we're not encouraging our children to do enough free play where they become the decision makers, where they alter the rules, where they create their own games. And that's what we have to facilitate. And we need to start doing that in our schools. It needs to be free play, not adult regimented play. So I probably have time for maybe just a couple of more questions. So I'll keep them as brief as possible. So one is, uh, what do you think is the future of broadcasting in this situation? And also the future of scouting, given the tech-oriented impact on sport? Ah, broadcasting, I see the ability for you to be your own broadcaster. For you to be able to show a game virtually in your own home and you be the broadcaster. So I can see that. And I guess, and I like that aspect of it all. I think people would enjoy that, enjoy the commentary. Scouting, it's obvious that you're going to be able to download things and share them quicker and do some comparisons and, and add in the analytics and the biometrics. Scouting is going to really capitalize on this, be able to do some things they haven't done before. And being able to be there virtually, you have all the technology in your shop that you just apply to the, vi the video that you're watching and be able to see the player play. Um, so that, that, that part of the game I see really adapting very easily. The second part of it was scouting. I mean, what do you think is the future of scouting and can technology help in that regard, especially in a country like India, you know, where we are so densely populated, we have different kinds of geographic settings. So how can technology help there? Okay, this past weekend in Clearwater, Florida, right near where I live, there was a softball tournament called the Elite, Elite Invitational, and it had... 20 of the top softball, women's softball teams in the United States. All right, every one of those games was being scouted by people in their own living room, just taking the, the, watching it on the television. Imagine if you could actually physically, virtually be there and with a stopwatch and do different things there. I mean, it'll be a lot of fun to be able to do that rather than have to go to the event, to travel the event. And they talk about one team not getting in until four o'clock in the morning and they played at 10 because of uh, the travel detail and that would affect the scout and that would affect anybody. So um, lots of opportunity, lots of opportunity to innovate. 
Okay, so I probably have time for one last question and I'll keep this uh, very open-ended or uh, maybe Sid can also take over after that. Um, my question is, uh, so a lot of people were actually asking that there is a lot of technology focus on sports. So what kind of future do you see for non-IT people, non-technology people to work in this industry? Apart from people who are the actual players, but in terms of employment, what about people who are not involved in technology? There's always going to be service people. There's always going to be people that are dealing with the experience. Um, there's always going to be a live audience. Now, the live audience might not be 70,000 people. Maybe the live audience, at some day, we're going to build elaborate TV studios. And we're going to play the games in elaborate TV studios, but we're still going to need an audience for reaction and noise. We're going to need to accommodate those fans. We're going to have to make them comfortable. We're going to have to make them enjoy what they're doing. We also have to constantly be monitoring people and surveying people and, and doing research and focus groups virtually or in person to find out how they react to the technology. Do they like it? What do they like? What don't they like? What, would, what can we do to improve it? The same thing about the live experience. So there's a lot of things on the marketing side rather than on the technology side that non-technology people could do and do well. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bill. Sorry, sorry, did I interrupt you? Sorry, please to complete. I, I was gonna ask you, we, we asked a poll as to what we thought was the second most popular sport in India after cricket. Did we get any results for the poll? So we actually didn't get a chance to ask it during our talk. So if you are curious, we can quickly maybe run it right away, if that's okay with you. Sure, anytime. Yeah, Navan, you want to run it right away? Yeah. Yeah, I request all uh, participants to please answer. You may see a poll right now in your screen. So please pick one option and click the submit button in the next 10 seconds. Okay, so I hope everyone's answered. Naman, I think you can close the poll also. Yeah, there's your results. All right. Well, the NBA people aren't going to be real happy with that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a little disappointed in that, but maybe we have more work to do. Maybe we're not, maybe our grassroots approach in basketball in India is not as effective as, it, as they think it is right now. But that's so also, I think the percentages you see for Kabaddi is also to do with the fact that Kabaddi has a very popular league, which is a very good home time watch. It's called the Kabaddi Premier League. Like, it's very, uh, popular in India as well. So thank you so much for taking so many questions. We actually still have a lot of them left. So what I'll try and do is send you an email with the questions that are left. And maybe if you can answer, we can actually send sure. email to the people who's, who've asked them. So All if right. I, can, I, sorry. I hope everyone enjoyed it. I hope that uh, I gave you more to, to think about than you thought about before the presentation. And hopefully, hopefully, you'll be the people that answer these questions that we po posed and help bring us forward in the future. Thank you so much, Dr. Bill. If I can now and quickly ask Siddharth Shankar, who is the lead in sports in the Reliance Foundation to deliver the vote of thanks. Over to you, sir. Thanks, Sanjay. Uh, I'll make this very quick. Uh, thank you, firstly, uh, Dr. Sutton or Bill, as we like to call him, for sharing your wisdom and experience. I think we've all learned a lot today. Uh, I want to thank everybody for attending. It's been a great uh, audience I, we've seen from the questions there were so many questions coming in across uh, throughout the throughout the webinar uh, so whether you were uh, you are new students prof new professionals experienced professionals i hope all of you got something out of this i certainly did um, the the phrase that comes to my mind uh, is uh, it's a cliche but adapt or die i think that's what comes to my mind when i think about this in spite of spending almost 14 years in this industry looking at how technology is going to disrupt this, this industry very rapidly in the next uh, few years, it just gets me thinking. And not just as professionals, I think as, as businesses, whether we're running a league, whether we're running a club, whether we're running an agency, we need to adapt. If we don't learn and adapt, we will get left behind. So I think this is a great thought starter to all of us. So I, I hope it gets you all thinking and, uh, this is the first of many sessions that we will hold uh, leading up to the Geo Institute Sports Management Program. So we will share a survey link with you. Please do share any other topics that you would like us to cover in the future. Thank you very much for your time again. Uh, have a good day or a good evening, wherever you are. And thanks so much again, Ben.
for your time. Thank you, everyone. Just a quick reminder that we will have our next uh, webinar on public health on uh, March 11th. And it is from a professor, Dr. William Ward, who is from the John Hopkins Institute. We'll very soon share details about the same on our social media platforms as well as on email. Once again, thank you so much for joining. And thank you to all our panelists and Dr. Bill, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.